Hello everyone, this is Sarah, and hopefully you can see the screen. Just underneath it, you will find a chat box. If you could let me know that you can hear me by telling me who you are and where you're from, it would be nice to know that um, there's somebody out there. <laughs> it's a little bit strange right now, um, sitting at home in my studio loft, waiting for my screen to show me that the webinar has actually started. So I am hoping that you can hear me. And just as soon as I get a little bit of feedback, I will start the webinar for real. And here it goes with my screen coming up. I hope that you can see it too. My screen is dealing with, uh, or my internet connection is dealing with the webinar going out and the webinar coming back in again on a different screen. So it's taking a little while for me to be able to see what's going on. Still waiting for my chat box to appear. And it's, it's here, okay. Hi from Chicago, yes, thank you. I. Are you fine? That is really good to know. Thank you for letting me know. If you can't hear me, here we go, some more. Palm Bay, Florida. Hi, Joanne. Nice to see you here. Hi, Sue from Philadelphia. And Kathy from Springfield. Mitzi from Texas. Sounds great in Michigan. Good to know. I hope you guys are all having some nice weather. Hi, Andre and Meg from Missouri. Patricia in Wisconsin. Yes, you can see my screen and hear me. That's really good to know. So people are coming on. We're gonna give them a couple of minutes just to make sure that everybody is hearing and seeing. And hey, Jim in Michigan. Jim is the one that helped me to put all of this together. And I'm so grateful for his help. Um, Maggie and Lisa in Miami, Florida, Betty in Florida, Judy from, that went by way too fast. Um, Kathy in Toronto, looking good in Minneapolis. Joyce in Florida, good to see you. Cindy in California, Penny in Oregon, Judy. Hey Judy, I remember you in Florida. Brenda, hello from Hawaii. I have to come out and visit you one of these days. That's um, one of the places on my list of places I have to go to. Claudia in Illinois. Sabina in California. Deborah in sunny California. We've had a beautifully sunshiny day here in Scottsdale, Arizona. The sun's just set and um, it's gone a little bit chilly. Is there a way to make this full screen? Um, I don't actually know. Maybe Jim could pop on and let us know how you would go about making this full screen. Janet in Winnipeg, Canada, hello. Lee in Walla Walla, that is a fantastic name. Laurie in Tennessee, North Carolina is sounding good. Calgary, hello in Calgary. Okay, I'm thinking that everybody can hear me, so let's get started. I am Sarah Badler, and for those of you who haven't met me before, I've been a quilt designer since 2009 when circumstances led me to get really clear about what it was that I wanted to do with my life and what I came up with is I want to create beauty, inspiration, and infinite creative joy, specifically as a quilt designer. It's um, the passion that found me later in life. Um, I didn't make my first quilt until 13 years ago for my daughter Heather's first birthday, and I fell in love with it, um, fell in love with quilting, fell in love with embroidery machines, and that's been my passion ever since. Before that, I was a stay-at-home mom to Heather, and as I just said, she's now 14. She just turned 14 in January, and also Jasmine, who is soon to be 10. Actually, three weeks from today, she will be turning 10, so both of them will be in double digits. 
before that, I was a software engineer and project manager. I actually have a PhD in computer science, and people quite often ask me where I get all of this technical skill from. So I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into that. And in case you're wondering about the funny accent, I was born and raised in England. I've been living in the United States for 18 years. Um, January 10th was my 18th anniversary here in the United States, all but three and a half years of though of that in Phoenix, Arizona, where I love because I love the blue sky and the sunshine. And if I have to have the heat that goes with it in the summer, that's just fine. Let me tell you a little bit about the Splash of Color quilt. This was created as a series quilt for McCall's Quilting Magazine. And the project actually started way back in the summer of 2014 when the editor at that time of McCall's Quilting, my good friend Susie Guzman, she asked me if I would design a queen-sized quilt for the magazine. And knowing that I had the brand new fabric line, my first fabric line, transformation coming out in 2015, we decided that we would create this quilt and the project to go in, uh, in, in one of the issues at the end of 2015. Um, as the whole thing progressed, everything changed. And actually, I completely changed the layout of the original quilt that I had submitted to them. And they called me and said, you know what, we really love this new design that you sent to us and we want to make it as a series quilt in 2016. So it's going to be in every issue of the magazine. So I was pretty excited about that. Parts one to five are applique blocks. There are four each of them, with the exception of um, block C, which is mirrored. So you do four one way around and then you mirror it and you do four another way around. Part six is going to be all about putting the quilt together. The original quilt I actually did create on my embroidery machine. I did all of the applique on my embroidery machine using a simple satin stitch around the applique shapes to showcase the beautiful colors of the fabric, the beautiful colors and the patterns on the fabric. And having submitted that to the magazine, I sat there looking at it for quite a while and I decided I just really, really, really wanted to make another version of the quilt that had solid fabrics, with, which is what I usually work with, and add the embroidered applique, which is my specialty to that. Hence, the second version of the quilt. And I'm literally making this quilt as we go together. I'm about a week ahead of you guys, um, or at least about a week ahead of the webinars that we're doing in creating a second version of this quilt. So what you see there on the screen is the graphic representation of it showing the color scheme. Okay, so part one, block A. In order to make the quilt, you will need to purchase a copy of the magazine, actually each issue of the magazine in 2016. It is available as a digital subscription if you'd like to be able to um, read the magazine on your iPad. Um, part one, we're going to make block A, which is the embroidered block or the applique block. There's also a pieced block, which I'm not going to um, talk about here. That's super simple piecing and we're going to focus here on the applique. So block A is an eight and a half finished square with a one and three quarter inch border around it, creating a 12 inch square block. There are two versions of it. The basic version at the top, which has the simple satin stitch outlining the applique shapes and it showcases the gorgeous colors and the pattern in the fabric. The other version is embroidered, and that is designed to be stitched out onto solid colors of fabric so that you can showcase the thread in the embroidered applique. Hoopings. We, there's a possibility to do this block in a single hooping, and it requires a hoop that will accommodate a design that is seven and three quarter inches or one, uh, 197 millimeters. So, that would be an equivalent to the Benina Mega, uh, the Benina Maxi Hoop, nearly said Mega Hoop then, the Benina Maxi Hoop will accommodate this design or a hoop 
of that nature. You can also, if you don't have that hoop available, then you can also do this in either two or three hoopings using a Benina large oval hoop or equivalent for two hoopings and a five by seven hoop for three hoopings. Today in the webinar, we're going to start out with how to do it as a single hooping. And then I'm going to show you how you can be completely successful doing it in multiple hoopings. I'm just noticing a comment from Andre there, which um, some of you might be interested in. If you're having a problem with the sound, she suggested you close all other applications. Okay, what's in the download? So as well as the magazine, you will need to purchase the Splash of Color Design Collection if you want to do the embroidered applique on there, either the basic version or the embroidered version. And so I wanted to let you know what's in the download. Of course, you'll find the embroidery designs. You'll find two, direct, or two folders, one called basic, one called embroidered. So the basic folder contains the designs which have the simple satin stitch outline. The embroidered folder contains the designs which have the embroidered applique in there for use with the solid fabrics. You'll always find multiple formats so that these designs can be stitched out on pretty much all domestic machines. You'll find SVG files for use with your electronic cutting machines. For example, the Silhouette Cameo, which is the one that I use, or the Brother Scan and Cut. And actually a good friend of mine came to the house yesterday with a brand new Scan and Cut that she received for Christmas. So we unpacked it and um, endeavored to get it working. It was a little bit different to the Scan and Cut, but gave us some beautiful results at the end. If you don't have access to an electronic cutting machine, there are also templates that you can print and trace. And I'm going to tell you a little trick about those, um, at least that will get you past the tracing part of that. And then you'll also find design worksheets or the thread charts. And there's two sets, one for the basic designs and one for the embroidered designs. So you'll find those in each of those folders. Then you'll find a whole bunch of PDFs that you can print or view on your screen. The block A template um, is what you can use if you're going to print and trace to cut out your applique shapes. Block A to color, pretty much the same thing. So if you want to try out some different colors, then you can sit down and have a good time coloring that and come up with a color combination that you absolutely adore. The splash of color applique cutting chart is the is for use with the SVG files for the embroidered version of the design. And splash of color applique cutting chart basic is for use with the basic designs. Now, the reason that there's two of the applique cutting charts for use with the SVG files is because of the way I colored the quilts. Um, the basic applique is colored quite differently to the embroidered um, or the, the solid fabric version of it. So there's two different cutting charts for use with your SVG files. Splash of Color Block A is going to give you the instructions on how to be successful with your embroidered applique. And we're going to go through all of that in the webinar today. There's also the copyright standard. Absolutely make this for your friends. Um, and if you want to make small projects and um, sell them, do that only at local venues, please. Splash of Color Solid Fabric contains the fabric requirements for the solid colored version of the quilt. The transformation fabric version of the quilt, you'll find all of those fabric requirements in the magazine. And then there's the whole Splash of Color Blank to Color quilt. Um, so go to town, test your colors out, print as many of these as you want, and come up with a color scheme that really works for you. So what will you need? Fabric. You've either got the transformation line by me, the Benetex, and if you want to use um, a different line of Pattern fabric, go for it. If, you, if you're using a pattern fabric, I would recommend that you go with the basic version of the embroidery design so that you can really showcase the 
wonderful colors in the pattern on your fabric. The solid version of the quilt, I'm using Michael Miller Cotton Couture. I love this fabric. It's incredibly soft and drapey, beautiful colors. Um, I think it comes in about 150 some colors. So there's really something for everybody. It's, uh, it's my favorite um, version of, so it, it, it's got the most colors to play with, I guess. That's why I love it so much. Thread, my favorite is Aurifil Cotton Mako. And if you're using the Transformation fabric, then there are two collections that go with that, the Transformation Warm collection and the Transformation Cool collection, 12 threads in each box. Um, so that will give you a total of 24 colors. And I hope you'll um, find that they are colors that you'll use over and over again. They're certainly some of my favorites. I'm just looking at the screen and seeing a note that the screen is unbelievably blurry. I believe that has to do with the resolution that you're seeing um, in the, that you're seeing at your end, and there is a setting for it. And I, for the life of me, can't remember what it is right now. And Jim is just answering that question, so. Um, scroll back so that you see the response from Jim Samples. He's telling you how you can fix the blurry screen. Okay, more about what you will need. Fusible webbing. This is going to go on the back of your applique shapes so that you can fuse the applique shapes in place. And I have two that I like to use. If I'm going to be cutting my applique shapes using an electronic cutting machine, then I like to use heat and bond light. That gives me by far the best results. If I'm going to use the templates to print and trace or the go cutter and dies, which you can use for this project, then my preferred fusible webbing is Shades Soft Fuse. Really wish that the Shades Soft Fuse would work with the electronic cutting machines, but it's not, um, it's not solid enough. Um, you need to have an, you need to add an awful lot more stabilizer to the fabric in order to get a good cut. So heat and bond light with the electronic cutting machines, shade soft fuse if you're using a go cutter or printing and tracing the templates. Stabilizer. The key for stabilizer is it needs to be a medium weight stabilizer and it needs to be tear away. When I first started doing embroidery, I used a cutaway stabilizer and was heartbroken when the first quilt that I made, which was actually for Heather's first birthday, when I was cutting away the stabilizer from around the applique shapes, I actually cut a hole in the background fabric and I was so upset. Um, but I learned that if I'm going to be doing embroidered applique, that by far the easiest way to make sure that I don't repeat that error is to use a tearaway stabilizer. My favorite is OESD Ultra Clean and Tear. So it's a medium weight and it's a tearaway. One thing I learned last year about the OESD Ultra Clean and Tear is that it will actually dissolve or disintegrate if you wash the project. So if you know that you're going to be washing the quilt, um, you can rest assured that this stuff is actually going to wash itself out after two or three washes. So that, um, that for me gives it even more plus points. Interfacing for your background fabric and some of your applique shapes is completely optional. Um, I would use it on the background fabric if I had chosen say a white or a very light color, then by putting the interfacing, and I use specifically Pellon Shape Flex, by putting that on the back of the background fabric, it's going to give me a slightly more stable background to work on. And it's also going to prevent show through of any batting or any loose threads underneath it. Um, the other time I would put interfacing on is if I, would, if, if I was using a, um, like a jacquard fabric background. And I came across this with my Heather Feather quilt, um, which I used, um, I can't remember the name of the fabric line, but it was a jacquard design and it wasn't evenly woven across the surface. So I would add an interfacing to that to give me a more solid surface to work on on, on my background. Now I would also add 
the Pelon Shape Flex onto the back of any light colored applique fabrics. And that's going to prevent show through of a dark background through a light colored applique shape. Spray starch, another option. Um, if you like to stitch onto a really sturdy piece of background fabric, then by all means, go ahead and use some spray starch. My, my favorite is Mary Ellen's Best Press and just light spritz on your background fabric will give you a little bit of added support there. Some other stuff that you're going to need. In the bobbin, I like to use Superior Bottom Line Tan, and that's number 619. I buy it on the 3,000 yard spools, as you can see in the picture here, because I use so much of it. I think you can get 22 um, Bonina 8 Series bobbins out of a 3,000 yard spool. So my favorite color is the Bottom Line Tan, and I use that for pretty much all of my embroidery. The only time I would change that is if I was stitching in white thread on a white background, in which I, case I would use a white thread in the bobbin. And the other time that I would change that if I was quilting in the hoop, where I'm quilting the whole quilt sandwich, in which case I will match the bobbin thread with whatever I've got on the top. Needles, superior titanium top stitch, size 8012. Those are my all time favorite needles. And again, I use that for just about everything. Every now and then I'll switch up to a 9014. Um, and if I'm working with a knitted fabric, then I'll switch over to a ballpoint needle. But for all of my quilting, um, piecing, quilting, embroidery, I use these titanium superior top stitch needles, size 8012. They actually last, um, with the five needles in this pack, you've probably got about 300 hours of stitching time on there versus the non-titanium needles, you're probably looking at six to eight hours per needle. So in a pack of five, you, you're gonna have about 40 hours of stitching. So the, these are really good value. You're going to need a small pair of sharp scissors for clipping your threads. And my favorite is the Havel's double curved scissors. I have a pair of these at each machine. I have one on the ironing board, I have one on the cutting table, and I have an extra pair to float around because people always move them and I can never find them when I need them, especially when the girls have been in the sewing room. Pins, those are going to be necessary and I'll show you exactly why. Scotch Magic Tape became one of my best friends in the last year or so, and I'm loving using that in my embroidery, holding my background fabric in place on the stabilizer. And again, I'll tell you more about that as we get there. And of course, you're going to need a clean embroidery machine. My recommendation is that you clean your embroidery machine every time before you start stitching. And by clean, I mean remove the bobbin plate or uh, the stitch plate, um, give a thorough brush. I like to use a jumbo paint brush. I bought a pack of 10 of them at one of the craft stores. Um, get that paint brush in all the nooks and crannies around the bobbin. You'd be surprised at how much lint builds up under net, underneath there. I'll also give it a little tiny squirt with a, a can of, um, condensed air, compressed air, whatever it's, uh, canned air. Um, just a little squirt of that, making sure that the nozzle is pointing from the back to the front so that anything that you do blow out is gonna come out of the open bobbin door. And then always give your machine a drop of oil. Now having said always give your machine a drop of oil, if you have a Benina machine, absolutely give your machine a drop of oil. Actually, I do that every single time I change the bobbin and it keeps my machines running really well. I know that not all machine brands um, like to be oiled, but my Beninas definitely love a drop of oil at the start of every new project and every time I change out the bobbin. Of course, you're going to need the designs, as I mentioned before, the splash of color designs, which you can purchase on my website at sarahvedlerdesigns.com, either as the bundle, which gives you a nice little discount, or you can purchase each block as it is made available. And the magazine, that's where you're gonna get all of the fabric requirements for the transformation version 
of the quilt and you'll also get all of the cutting requirements for that and all of the pieced parts of the quilt, all of the instructions on how to put the quilt together are going to be in the magazine. So a subscription to that is in order too. Okay, let's get started with the good stuff. The steps to success in embroidered applique. Basically, there are three things that are going to happen. First, you're going to prepare your applique shapes. Second, you're going to pre prepare your background fabric. And third, you're going to stitch the design out. So let's look at each of those steps in a little bit more detail. So preparing your applique shapes. So there are three ways that you can cut out your applique shapes for this particular project. First, you can print and trace the templates provided. Second, you can use some AccuQuilt Go dies, which are available for this project. And third, you can use the SVG files that are provided, and you can use those with your electronic cutting machine. So I'm talking there about the Silhouette Cameo, the Brother Scan and Cut, and I know there are a few more out there on the marketplace. So for all methods of cutting, you need to prepare the applique fabric before you can cut the shapes. So first of all, you're going to apply your fusible webbing to the wrong side of your fabric. And as I mentioned before, Shade Soft Fuse is my favorite for the print and trace method or if I'm using the AccuQuilt Go dies. And Heat and Bond Light is if I'm using the SVG files and an electronic cutting machine. Question that I've seen, um, I think a little bit on the Facebook group is, is it necessary to start your applique fabric or use Terial Magic? I personally don't like to add stuff to my fabric if it's not absolutely necessary. So I find when I'm using the SVG files for my electronic cutting machine, for the size of the applique shapes in this particular project, the heat and bond light by itself is going to give me a great cut. There is no real need to apply any starch, i.e. the Mary Ellen's Best Press or the uh, Terial Magic to that. So I'm going to say right now, no, it's not really necessary to starch your applique fabric. The second question, is it necessary to interface your applique fabric if you're using the transformations fabric, I'm going to say no, it's really not necessary to interface your applique fabric. However, if you're using the Michael Miller Cotton Couture, it's a super fine weight fabric. And what I have found is that it is fine enough that some stronger colors will show through it. So I would recommend doing one of two things. You could either interface it with the Pellon Shape Flex, which is a white woven fusible interfacing, or you could literally just fuse two pieces of the colored fabric together, and that will prevent any show through. It will give you um, much stronger, clearer colors for your applique shapes. So if you're going to use the print and trace method using the templates provided, you're going to use the block a template.pdf file, and there are two pages in it. The first page has the block printed out as it will look when it is finished, and there is a black box on there that when you've printed the document out, that black box should measure six inches square. So you want to make sure that you print at 100%. The second page is showing you what the block looks like when it's mirrored. And this is the one that you want to use when you trace the applique shapes onto your fusible webbing. And um, you do actually want to trace the applique shapes onto your fusible webbing before you apply the fusible webbing to the wrong side of your applique fabric. Now, one of the questions or one of the comments that comes to me through the emails quite often with a fair bit of panic attack or a panic attached to it is 
my templates aren't printing at the right size. They're too small. They, they don't fit the placement lines for the design. And the cause of that is usually um, the default for Adobe Reader, which you're going to use to open the PDF file, the default is to print um, print to fit or shrink to fit. So I've got three different versions of how to print a PDF file here. On the left-hand side of my screen, this is the screen that comes up when I print a PDF on my iMac, so using the Mac operating system. And you can see the red arrow here. You want to make sure that scale is set to 100%. The default is going to have it as scale to fit. And you never know how much that's going to actually shrink the design. So you want to make sure that you set scale to 100% there. On the right-hand side of the screen, this is on a PC using Windows 10. And you can see the red arrow here is pointing to custom scale. And I've set that to 100%. Um, this one, I think the default was shrink oversized pages. So if you're finding that your applique shapes aren't printing to the correct size, then it's more than likely that it's shrinking it to fit onto the page. So make sure you've got 100%. Now, the other thing that I discovered on Windows 10, I'm pretty new to using Windows 10. And when I open the PDF up by clicking on it, it defaulted to opening up in Microsoft Edge. And that is the black screen on the bottom left-hand corner. I couldn't find anywhere in that print setting to change the size to make sure that it was going to print at 100%. So I came to the conclusion that it was much better to ignore Microsoft Edge and open the PDF file in Adobe Reader. So in order to do that, if your default is set to open up in Microsoft Edge, you want to go ahead and find the file in um, Windows Explorer. You're going to right click on the file name, and then you should be able to choose Open With, and a little pop-up box, pop-up menu will appear, and you can choose Adobe Reader from there, assuming that you have got it installed on your computer. OK, so when you, if you don't have an AccuQuilt Go cutter or the right die, and you don't have the, one of the electronic cutting machines, and your option is you've got to print and trace the templates provided, what do you do if your printer won't print so that that square is six inches. Um, or you don't have a good printer for whatever reason. So there's actually a way that you can do this really well without having a good printer. And it's going to guarantee that your applique shapes are the exact right size to fit into the design. So this is what you're going to do. You're going to load the design into your embroidery machine. and. Before I go here, um, one thing that I neglected to tell you earlier, just in case you're madly scribbling down notes, um, tomorrow morning you will receive a link to a replay so that you'll be able to watch the webinar all over again and you'll be able to pause it when you need to take down notes. So you're going to load the design into your embroidery machine. You're going to load a piece of stabilizer into your hoop. You're going to skip past... Um, color one and go straight to color two. And the first thing that stitches out in color two is a basting line. And that is going to stitch a square out on your stabilizer. And you're going to need to halt the machine as soon as it's finished stitching that square. At this point, you're going to remove all thread from the machine and you're going to need to turn off your thread sensors. So you're going to remove the top thread. You can actually leave the bobbin thread in, but you're still going to need to turn off any thread sensors for the top thread and the bobbin thread. Then you're going to take a piece of cardstock and tape it in place on the stabilizer in the hoop so that it covers the square that you've stitched onto the stabilizer. 
Now you're going to rethread the machine. Actually, no, you're not. I'm, I need to keep reading my slide here. You're going to continue stitching color number two with no thread. And what this is going to do, it's going to stitch out the placement line showing you where to put the applique shapes. And it's going to, the needle is going to punch little tiny holes in the piece of cardstock that you've got taped onto the stabilizer and the hoop. So you're getting a perfect fit for each of the applique shapes. And you can cut around the shapes with a pair of scissors to, um, it, it's going to be pretty well perforated, not perforated quite enough to be able to snap them out, but uh, so you're going to need your pair of scissors to cut them out. Um, you can either cut away the background, leaving the actual applique shapes, in which case when you trace around each of these shapes onto your fusible webbing, you want to make sure that you cut just inside the, the line that you draw around the shapes to make sure that you're not adding um, even, even the pencil width to the size of the applique shapes. The alternative would be to discard the actual shape, leaving with you with the background, in which case you it, it's like um, drawing around a stencil. So And in that case, you're going to want to make sure that you cut pretty much on the line when you're cutting out your applique shapes. So that's another, that's a really good way of creating your applique shapes if you don't have a good printer, or even if you do have a good printer, um, but, and you wanna make absolutely sure that your applique shapes are going to be the right size. Okay, if you have the AccuQuilt Go Cutter, and you could use either a Go Baby or the regular size Go, and even the Go Big, that works, the electronic version of the machine or the push button version of the machine. There are two dies that you will need for the whole project. And those are the Go Heather Feather Border Die, which is number 55414. And um, for this particular block, you'll also need the Go 2 inch, 3 inch, 5 inch circle. Um, the circle in this design is a 3 inch circle, which you're going to need. And that die number is 55012. Jumping ahead, and I haven't got this on this slide, but you'll also need to use Go Heather Feather number two. And we're going to use the two hearts from there, the small, tiny heart and the bigger heart on that die. And we're going to use those in the future blocks. My preferred fusible here, again, is the Shades Soft Fuse. And you want to make sure that you apply the fusible webbing to your applique fabric before you do any cutting. Now, what I do is I measure each shape. I, I use my rotary cutting ruler and I allow quarter of an inch all around. So I cut my pieces of fabric quarter of an inch all around. The gray areas on the die picture here, which are in the instructions that come with your download, those show you the shapes that you want to be cutting. If it's shaded with the light gray, then you want to make sure that you place the fabric right side down. And for shape number 16 on the right hand side, which is shaded with the dark gray, you want to make sure that you place the fabric right side up. And the Go Cutter will happily cut four layers of fabric at one time, which is super convenient. For this particular project, we're stitching out four blocks, so you need four of everything. So you can cut those all out at one time. A um, little bit of fabric saving, if you can see here, shapes numbers 18 and 19, we're using both of those. So when you're figuring out how much fabric you need, you can cut out a piece of fabric that covers both of those shapes at the same time. Now, the last version or the last method for cutting out your applique shapes is to use the SVG files provided with your electronic cutting machine. Um, so my favorite fusible webbing to use for this is Heat and Bond Light. And again, you want to apply the fusible webbing to your applique fabric before you do any cutting. And when I'm cutting with my silhouette, I leave the backing paper on when I do the cutting. Now, 
Um, I think there are two, two camps about leave it on or leave it off. I like to leave it on because it's super easy to lift my applique shape off after it's been cut and I don't have any risk that I'm going to um, distort any of the bias edges. And let's face it, just about every edge on all of these shapes is a bias edge. So I leave the backing paper on, which allows me to lift the, uh, the fabric with a fusible webbing stuck to it off really cleanly. Now, it does mean that I'm left with the backing paper stuck to the sticky mat, so what you'll find is over time, as you use your mat more and more, getting the papers off is going to be much easier. But one thing that I do, whenever I get a brand new cutting mat, I take the protective liner off it and I put it sticky side down on my carpet. Usually um, after I've that, so I don't get too many dog hairs stuck to it, what with the two puppies that we've got around here. But by putting it down onto the carpet, pressing it in so that it gets a little bit linty. That removes the excess stickiness and it makes it much easier to peel my applique shapes or more specifically the backing paper from the fusible webbing off the mat once I've done my cut. I recommend starting a project of this size with a brand new blade. Um, the default blade setting on my Cameo for cutting um, thin fabric is, I, I think it's number three. So what I do is I start out with it at number three and as I notice that I'm getting um, un uncut threads in some of my cuts, I'll start to let more blade out. So after a little bit, I will set, I'll adjust the blade so it has a setting of four. And again, once I start to see more threads that aren't getting cut, I'll extend a little bit more blade. So that's going to extend the life of your blade just a little bit. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail or any more detail on how to use the Cameo or any of the other electronic cutting machines to cut your fabric applique shapes, but I will point you towards a blog post that I wrote about it that you can refer to bottom right hand corner of the screen, embroidered-applique.com slash category slash silhouette cameo. Um, if you go to embroideredapplique.com or sarahvedladesigns.com, we'll get you to the exact same place. Click on blog in the top menu. And then on the right hand side of the screen, you're going to see a bunch of categories. Click on silhouette cameo. And under there, you'll see a number of posts that I've written about using the cameo cutting machine and Two specifically, one how to cut fabric or how to cut your applique shapes using the Cameo and another one how to get the best cut for cutting fabric on your machine. And again, um, refer to the Splash of Color applique cutting chart basic for the basic designs and Splash of Color applique cutting chart .pdf for the embroidered designs. That's going to tell you how big you need to cut your pieces of applique fabric in order to cut the shapes in each color for all four copies of the block that blocks that you're going to be making. Before I go on to step one, I realize I completely forgot to tell you another thing. Um, if, and I notice there's a whole lot of chatting going on over here. I'm seeing it out of the corner of my eye. Thanks so much to everybody who's jumping in and helping the people who are having problems. I really appreciate that. If you have a question, pop it, write it down on the chat and I have a little bit of time um, at the end scheduled so that I can come and answer some of the questions and I'll only be answering the questions that a number of different people are asking. So go ahead and write your questions down there and I will come back to them towards the end of my presentation. Okay, so now, however you've gotten to this point, whether you've used the print and trace templates, whether you've used the AccuQuilt Go dies, or whether you've used the SVG files with your electronic cutting machines, you should now have 
your applique shapes cut out for all four blocks. You should also have four pieces of background fabric. And bear in mind, this is an eight and a half inch finished square that we're making. It would be nine inches square if you had seam allowances. And I'm adding an extra inch because I'm doing embroidery. I know the embroidery is going to shrink the background fabric down just a little tiny bit. And so this gives me a little bit of wiggle room. So my background fabric, I've cut to 10 inches square. I've also got the eight pieces for the block sides. And from the magazine, that's going to tell you, you need to cut those two and three quarter inches by nine inches. And I've also got my eight pieces for the top and bottom of the block. And the magazine is also going to tell you that those pieces need to be two and three quarter inches by 12 and a half inches. I'm just going to take a sip of water here. Okay. Now we're ready for step two, and that is to prepare your background fabric. So you've got your 10 inch square of background fabric. And you need to cut a 10 inch square of stabilizer. So the OEC Ultra Clean and Tear or whichever medium weight tear away stabilizer that you're going to be using. Now, when I first started out doing embroidered applique, I would always mark the background fabric and I would attempt to use a marking pen that I knew would disappear until the day came I used a marking pen which got heat set into my nice dark brown background fabric I'd used white clover marking pen um, actually it didn't get heat set in with an iron it I, I live in sunny Phoenix Arizona and the heat of the sun is sometimes hotter than an iron especially when you're in the car and this particular quilt what for whatever reason got left in the car and the white marking pen got heat set onto my chocolate brown fabric so I determined after that that I was not going to be marking any background fabric unless it was absolutely necessary there had to be a better way of doing it and so I started marking the back or marking this a piece of stabilizer and then basting it onto the background fabric. And it actually turns out to have a whole bunch of advantages to it. So this is my preferred way of doing things. So I've got a 10 inch square of stabilizer. So that's the same size as my backing fabric. And as you'll read in the instructions, it says to mark a vertical line down the center of the stabilizer and then mark a horizontal line that's perpendicular to it through the center of the stabilizer. So I'm pretty picky when it comes to my marking tools. I like to use either a five millimeter or a 0.5 millimeter mechanical pencil. That gives me a really nice fine pencil line. What I've come across in some of the classes that I've taught is that sometimes it's not so easy to see uh, the pencil line so my alternative is to use a extra fine black sharpie pen and make sure that you're not using a sharpie marker I found that those have a tendency to bleed on the stabilizer but I like to use a extra fine sharpie pen so I draw my vertical line using the markings on my rotary cutting ruler so a 12 inch ruler marking a 10 inch piece of stabilizer, I've got it centered um, vertically on the stabilizer, so I've got an inch off either end, and I'm using the five inch line on the ruler to give me the middle. And I put a little marker there at six inches, which is in the center of that line, and that's the marker that I'm going to use when I turn the ruler around to mark the horizontal line. Now, Having drawn one line on the stabilizer in order to guarantee that the second line I draw is perpendicular, I now want to use my rotary cutting ruler using the first line drawn as the, as the guide for drawing the second line. I don't want to use the edge of the stabilizer because it's not always so that I cut a square piece of stabilizer. 
So as soon as I've drawn one line, forever after, any other lines that I draw should be in reference to that first line drawn. So imagine if you're um, cu cutting up a piece of fabric, maybe you're cutting a bunch of six inch squares or something. So use the rotary cutting ruler in the same way. Only difference is that instead of having a rotary cutter in your hand, you've got a, a marking pen in your hand. So now I've got my marked piece of stabilizer. It's basically got a big plus sign right in the center of it. I'm going to put that, um, okay, so put the background fabric right side down on the table and then put the piece of stabilizer marked side up so that it's centered on the fabric, on the background fabric, and then baste it or pin it so that it's held in place. And then I'm going to take that to my sewing machine and I'm just noticing my blank screen here with no instruction, not sure quite where they went, but anyway, um, I'm going to use a straight stitch foot or in my particular case, this is my no number 34 D foot on my Benina. It's the clear foot with the nice red line down. So I can follow along that line that I've drawn with my line of stitching I'm going to stitch along this line with a four millimeter stitch length. That's what should be written on the left-hand side of this screen. Four millimeter stitch length. That is going to give me a really nice, secure line of basting that holds the background fabric to the stabilizer. But it's easy enough that it's really simple to clip a few stitches and pull that line of stitching out. So by the time I've stitched the vertical and the horizontal line, use, following the lines on the stabilizer, that has attached my piece of stabilizer to my piece of background fabric. And when I turn it over and look at the right, uh, look at the, the right side of the fabric, which is shown on the right hand side of the screen, now I have a line of stitching that is showing me the center point of my background fabric from the right side. So the beauty here is that both the top and the bottom of my piece of background fabric have a very clear marking on them. So now, having got that marked piece of background fabric, I am ready to stitch the design. And to determine which set of designs you need to use, it basically is determined by how big your hoop is. So if your hoop is 197 millimeters square or in inches that's seven and three quarter inches square then you can use one hooping and that's would be the equivalent of a banana maxi hoop if you don't have one of those but you have a standard banana large oval hoop using those dimensions then you can do two hoopings and if you don't have one of those um if you do have a five by seven inch hoop, then you're going to need to do this in three hoopings. So first of all, we're going to look at how to do this in one hooping. And you can either use the basic version of the design, which is shown on the left hand side, or you can use the embroidered version of the design, which is shown on the right hand side. And the design name is block A, pretty simple there. So the first thing that you're going to do, you're going to load the design into your embroidery machine and you're going to load a new piece of stabilizer into your hoop. So whenever I do embroidered applique that ends up in a quilt, I've typically got two layers of my OSD Ultra Clean and Tear stabilizer. One is attached to the back of the background fabric and the second layer goes into the hoop. I have a wriggling puppy who is sleeping nicely. She's sitting on my lap and trying to eat me. So, okay, we've got a bone now. Okay, so designs in the machine, stabilizer in the hoop, and you're going to stitch color number one directly onto the stabilizer in the hoop. And for those of you who know me well, I never hoop fabric, if it can be avoided, never hoop fabric. Um, allows me to do all kinds of amazing and wonderful things and it allows me to get my placement exact to 100%. So 
So I'm going to stitch color number one onto the stabilizer and the hoop. And you can see in the picture, I've got my piece of background fabric. I've got the big plus based it on there, right in the center of the fabric. And what stitches in color number one is a corresponding placement line. Looks exactly the same. You've got another big plus and it stitches right in the center of this hoop. So the goal is to align the intersection that comes from the basting on the background fabric with the intersection stitched onto the stabilizer and the hoop. So the red line there, we're gonna get the one end of the arrow positioned right where the point of the arrow goes. Now, in order to do this, you, you're going to be best off doing this on a padded surface. Now, when I used to teach at Sew From The Heart, we discovered that their chair cushions had nice padded surfaces and those worked really well. My preferred surface to do this on is a June Taylor cushioned quilters square and blocker. That's a June Taylor cushioned quilters square and blocker. And it's, uh, I think it measures 18 inches by 24 inches. It's an ironing board. It does not have a cutting mat on the back. It's purely an ironing board. And whatever is in the middle of it, um, the piece of plywood or whatever they, they used in the middle of it, you can actually push a pin into that board and it will go all the way through and out the other side. And that gives you a really good anchor point. What I found with the other June Taylor ironing boards, um, especially those that have the cutting mat on the back of the mids, they have something different in them that you can't, push the pin in. So the cushioned quilt is square and blocker. You're going to guide a pin through the intersection that you've basted onto the background fabric. So you can see I've got my pink headed pin here, right in the center or right on the intersection where my two lines are crossing. And now I'm going to guide that same pin through the intersection that's stitched onto the stabilizer and the hoop. So you can see that same pin in the big picture there, where I've got the red thread um, marking my in, uh, placement line on this stabilizer and the hoop. So one pin, first of all, through the background fabric, second through the stabilizer. And I'm going to push that pin as far as it will go into the board. Now, make sure that you're not doing this on your best dining room table because the pin will go all the way through the board and it will scratch if it comes out the other side. So I um, either do this down on the floor, which is, um, I have a little photo studio set up on the floor by the window where I get my best lighting, or probably more appropriate would be to do it on my cutting table so that when the pin does go through, it um, hits onto the cutting mat, doesn't damage the table. You're going to smooth the background fabric so that it's flat on the stabilizer in the hoop, and then you're going to align the fabric and you're going to use that pin as a pivot point. So what you want to do is lift up the bottom of the background fabric, and you can see here in the big picture, I've lifted up just the edge of it so that I can see the placement line that's stitched onto the stabilizer in the hoop, and I'm going to rotate the background fabric around that anchor pin until I've got perfect alignment and the beauty of the basting line, I can see the placement line marked on the front of the fabric and I can also see the placement line as it's marked on the back of the fabric. And you can see there the blue thread that I've got on the fabric is perfectly in alignment with the pink thread that's on the stabilizer in the hoop. Now I'm going to repeat that on the right hand side of the block and all being well, it should be if the bottom's right, then that should be correct too. And I'm also going to check at the top of the block and on the left-hand side of the block. Now, what I found pretty much every time when somebody is doing this and one direction matches and the other direction doesn't match, you want to make sure that the intersection you, you based it onto your fabric, your marking line that you drew first, you want to make sure that you have a good right angle there. So if you're not getting, if it's not looking like it's going to line up when you get to this point, revisit the lines that you marked onto the stabilizer and then baste it to make sure that they are actual perfect right angles. 
Now, when you're sure that your alignment is perfect, you're going to use either the Scotch Magic Tape or some pins to hold the background fabric in place on the hoop. And I'm working with my Benina Maxi hoop here. You can see I have plenty of space along the top and the bottom um, where I've got plenty of excess stabilizers. So I'm using the Scotch Magic Tape, good long piece um, all the way along the top of the block and all the way along the top bottom of the block to hold it in place when i've got it tape and if you don't have if, if you can't touch if uh, i guess if you have a square hoop and you don't have any excess stabilizer then you're going to need to use the pins to um hold the background fabric in place once it's in place you're going to remove the anchor point or the anchor pin and you're going to return the hoop to the machine and stitch out color number two now this is a basting line and it's going to hold the background fabric securely in place. And I know you've used the scotch tape, but um, the basting line is added security. It's also going to make sure that as you're stitching, the background fabric doesn't um, pucker up a little bit. And it's going to go straight into stitching out the placement lines showing you where to put the applique shapes. So now, the fabrics on the hoop, you've got the placement lines for your applique shapes. You're going to take the hoop off the machine. Make sure that you don't take anything out of the hoop at this point. Just remove the hoop from the machine. And you're going to remove the basting line from underneath the applique shapes. And it, it's uh, the basting line usually stitches out. Uh, uh, well, I, I told you earlier, stitch the basting line out with a four millimeter stitch length. And I'm talking about the basting line that you stitch to mark the center of the block, not the basting line that's holding the background fabric onto the quilt. You're gonna clip every three or four stitches and then use a pair of tweezers to pull those loose threads out. The benefit of doing this now rather than at the end is that if the basting line is sticking out from underneath a, an application, you don't want that loose thread or you don't want that little thread sticking out. Um, it's not gonna look very pleasant. So now I'm going to fuse my applique shapes in place. And this is the point in the process. I do my best with a design to make sure that you have a perfect result with your embroidery. The only thing I can't do is put the applique shapes down for you. Um, and this is where it can make the biggest difference to your project. You want to make sure that you put your applique shape exactly in the placement line, um, especially if you've used the SVG files to cut the shapes or if you've used the AccuQuilt Go dies, the shapes will be a perfect fit. So you want to make sure that they're perfectly lined up because this is going to make the biggest difference to your finished um, project. Now, I like to do this with a small, hot, dry iron. I know this maxi hoop is big enough that I can get my full-sized iron in there. I still like to use my small iron. And I have the little gray one that's shown on the left-hand side there. It's a top flight ceiling iron. Top flight ceiling iron. Um, it replaced the Hobbico mini iron that I used to use. Um, which is not available anymore. Um, and the only place that I found to get these from is Amazon. The other one, which I discovered when I went to Florida last December to do the workshop for Once Upon a Quilt, is this Clover Wedge Iron. Gorgeous little iron, great size, gets nice and hot, it's nice and dry, and the best part of it, it's pink. Um, I like to have pretty things in my studio. So one of these days, I think one of these clover irons is going to find its way into my studio. So now your applique shapes are in place. You're going to return the hoop to the machine and you're going to continue stitching, changing colors as necessary. Um, I'm using the embroidered version of the designs here. If you're using the basic version of the designs, it's going to stitch out or the technique that you're going to use is exactly the same. It's just going to stitch out a little bit differently. All of my satin stitches have an outline and a, what I call an inline, which is a triple stitch. So around the outside edge of the satin and around the inside edge of the satin. 
I had a lady send me an email and I think this must have been the first time she had stitched out one of my designs and she said what am I doing wrong the placement line stitching all over again after I've done the satin stitch and it's not a placement line all over again it's a triple stitch that I use to finish the edges of my satin stitch gives them a super nice look and depending on the thread colors that you use you can create a more 3d effect so if you used say a medium shade of thread for your satin stitch if you used a light for the outside and dark on the inside then you're going to create um, a really nice effect there and you can play with the colors I typically do the outlining with a thread that is the same color as my background fabric you're going to continue stitching until on my Benina I get the flag red flag at the end that tells me that everything is all done and I want to make sure that I get the best result possible so I make sure that my jump threads are trimmed carefully as I'm stitching I usually work with my thread cutter turned off that is purely personal preference um, and I make sure that I trim my jump threads as I go along so that I don't end up with layers of stitching over the top of the jump threads making it really difficult to pull them out and there's a close-up of the finished stitching and it's looking pretty good there's a couple of places where I needed to trim the um, trim the loose threads off but I think that looks pretty good when your design is finished you want to remove everything from the machine or you want to remove the hoop from the machine and then you're going to remove everything from the hoop and the first thing that you're going to do is tear away the stabilizer that was in the hoop from around the outside of your applique shapes and then because you're all done with this you've got the whole block stitched out you're going to tear away the stabilizer that was based in the background fabric from around the outside of the applique shapes. And I don't remove the stabilizer from underneath the applique shapes. It's, um, it's really not necessary. It can get way too fiddly. Um, the other thing is that when I'm quilting, I find that by having that layer of stabilizer in there, especially when I use uh, Quilter's Dream Wool is my favorite batting. And that stabilizer under the applique shape gives me a little bit of lift when I use it with that particular batting. And it gives me a really nice trapuntoed effect when I do my quilting without any of the effort that need, uh, goes into the trapunto. I showed you this picture for a reason, actually. I wanted you to see what the tension should be looking like on the back. So you can see around the circle, you can see the bobbin thread. It's the tan 619 um, superior bottom line I can see a good amount of my top thread coming through but I can also see the bobbin thread and again on the satin stitch if you look at the big orange shape on the right hand side um, actually it's a little bit hard to tell but I'm I'm showing some of the top thread coming through to the back and I'm also seeing the bobbin thread so I know that my tension is good and none of my bobbin thread shows up on the top at all you wouldn't know um, that I had used something that wasn't a perfect match to the top thread okay let's move on to stitching the design in two hoopings so you're either going to use the basic version or you're going to use the embroidered version and the instructions are going to tell you that um, for this design, th there are two hoopings. So block A, split one with an A or a B. Um, with three hoopings, the, the design names are block A, split two, and then you've got A, B, and C. And the instructions tell you to stitch out A first and B second. Now, when I was... Um, stitching out this block the other day so that I could take photographs for the webinar I had originally got it so that a was the left hand side of the block and B was the right hand side of the block and what I figured out really soon actually I'd gotten as far as 
stitching out the placement lines for the applique shapes, and it occurred to me that um, the applique shapes were covering up the intersection that I needed to use for hoop, doing the second hooping. So I switched the two designs um, so that now we're going to start with the right-hand side of the block as A and the left-hand side of the block as B. And I sent out an email to everybody who's purchased the collection already um, about this change. You only need to re-download the designs if you're going to be stitching out in two hoopings. If you're only going to be using one hooping, then you're in good shape already. But if you do need to use two hoopings, if you download the designs again using the link that I sent out earlier this afternoon, um, then I've got the amended files here. And it literally is just a name change. If you haven't purchased the designs yet, but you're going to, then no worries, everything is good as it is. Okay, so for each of the two hoopings, this is what we're gonna do. It's pretty much exactly the same sequence of steps that we went through for the single hooping. We're just gonna do it twice. So we're gonna load the design into the embroidery machine. We're going to load a new piece of stabilizer into the hoop. We're going to stitch color number one onto the stabilizer in the hoop, and that's the placement line to show me where to align the background fabric. So now I'm going to do that. I'm going to remove the hoop from the machine, go to my um, quilters, cushion, square, and blocker. I'm going to align the background fabric with the, the intersection that's basted onto the background fabric with the intersection that's stitched onto the stabilizer in the hoop. Now I'm going to go back to the machine. I'm going to stitch color number two. That's the basting line to hold the background fabric onto the who onto the stabilizer in the hoop so that it's securely positioned. And it's also going to stitch the applique placement lines. Take the hoop off the machine, go to your ironing board, fuse the applique shapes in place, stitch all of the remaining colors with the hoop back on the machine. Then you're gonna remove the stabilizer that was in the hoop from around the outside of the applique shapes. And after the first hooping, the background, the, the stabilizer based it onto the background fabric, that stays in place until the end, until you're completely finished with all of the stitching. So after the first hooping, you're just gonna remove the stabilizer that was in the hoop. And then you're gonna do this all over again. New design, new piece of stabilizer stitch. And I do actually have that in pictures here. So two hoopings, number one, the design that you want to load first is block A, split one A. And that's the left hand, um, the left hand part of the block. So you're going to load a piece of stabilizer into the hoop. You're going to stitch color number one, which is the placement line. And you're now going to align the intersection based onto the background fabric with that intersection that's stitched onto the stabilizer. You're going to do the exact same process as for one block. You're going to put a pin through the intersection in the background fabric, and you're going to guide that pin into the intersection that's stitched out onto the stabilizer in the hoop, and then you're going to make sure that the background fabric is flush with the stabilizer in the hoop hoop nicely smoothed out, lift the right hand side up to make sure that your alignment, you're going to use the pin as an anchor point to um, rotate the background fabric until you've got perfect alignment on the right hand side. Then you're going to check the, the top and the bottom to make sure that they're perfectly aligned as well. And then you're going to use the scotch tape and this does not, I'm using my large oval hoop on my Benina machine here. Um, there's not a huge amount of stabilizer showing beyond the block, but there's enough that I can use some um, scotch tape to hold everything in place there. Now, when I'm doing multiple hoopings, I want to make sure that my placement of the fabric onto the hoop is 100% spot on. So I have a couple of checks that I'm going to do. So the first check, I'm going to hold the hoop up to a light source and I'm going to look at it from the behind. Now here in Scottsdale we had a beautiful sun, sunshiny day when I was working on this so I went to the window and I'm holding the hoop up so I can see the back 
and the light shining through from the window or if if it's snowing outside and blowing a blizzard then um, maybe you're going to do this with your lamp or the main light light source in your sewing room but with the light shining through I can clearly see this uh, the placement line that is stitched onto the stabilizer and I can also see the basting line that I use to mark the center of the background fabric. Now the only time this becomes a little bit challenging is if you're using a really dark background fabric. Um, but for most cases you're going to be able, you'll be able to get enough light through so that you can see that I've got a perfect match on the vertical and I've also got a perfect match on the horizontal there. So that's my first check. And the second check is not so much to make sure that the fabric's perfectly centered, it's to make sure that the fabric's actually in the right place. Um, so you're gonna hold the hoop up next to the screen and with a picture of the block in your mind, the finished block in your mind, look at what's gonna stitch and look at what it's gonna stitch onto or where it's going to stitch on the background fabric and basically if you put the background fabric on upside down or if you if it's in the wrong place it's going to be pretty obvious um, so we're stitching the right hand side of the block yes this looks like I've got the right hand side of the block actually hooped um, placed onto the hoop onto the stabilizer and the hoop so everything's going to stitch out in the right place now back on the machine, I'm gonna stitch color number two. That's my basting line, holding the background fabric in place on the hoop, and it's also my applique placement line. Now, when I remove the basting lines from underneath the applique shapes, I want to be absolutely certain that I leave the main intersection intact. So the turquoise line of thread here is the intersection that I'm using to get my background fabric in place on the hoop do not remove that intersection but um for the for the rest of the placement or the basting line that is gonna it's only actually going to hit just ever so slightly on that on the moon shape uh, just on the point there but don't take the thread out or don't take the yeah don't take the thread out so that you eliminate your intersection there fuse your applique shapes in place Return the hoop to the machine and continue stitching, changing your colors as required. And there you are with your first hooping all done. Now you'll see here, if, you're, if you've got a clear um, display that um, there is a little bit of puckering on the left-hand side of my circle here. And um, I hadn't adjusted the basting line when I discovered that I needed to stitch the right hand side out before the left hand side in order to make the hooping, the multiple hooping part easier. In the design that you will download with the update, um, the basting line is around the whole of the design. So any um, slight puckering that I got here, that will be eliminated when you use the new design that I sent to everybody. Okay. You're going to remove everything from the hoop and clip the outer basting line every three to four stitches so that when you remove the stabilizer that was in the hoop, those st stitches are actually magically going to pop out um, if you clip every three to four of them. Um, or alternatively, you can actually clip them all and then just give a little gentle tug on the bobbin thread and those uh, little bits of basting thread are going to pop right out there. So you want to remove the stabilizer that was in the hoop from around the outside of the applique shapes. The stabilizer that's basted to the background fabric stays in place. Now we're going to stitch part two. So this is this block, block A split one B design. You're going to load that into your embroidery machine. You're going to load a new piece of stabilizer into the hoop and you're going to stitch color number one. Now you'll see um, for, for part A, you had a back to front T where the, which was on the left hand side of the hoop. Now you've, it, uh, not back to front, it's kind of a sideways T. 
Um, now the intersection's over on the right-hand side of the hoop because we're going to be stitching the left-hand side of the block. So you're going to align the background fabric using that intersection. So follow the red arrow from the intersection on the background fabric. You're going to get that line perfectly with the intersection that stitches on the hoop there. And you're going to use the same pin. So put your pin through the background fabric, then guide that same pin through the intersection on the hoop. And I've actually got, I don't know if you remember, the first time I had a pink thread marking the placement line for the fabric on the stabilizer in the hoop because I knew that pink was the first thread that I actually needed to stitch with. It was um, actually the uh, first line of satin stitch. This time I have the blue thread and that's because the blue thread is the last thread that I used when I stitched out part A. So no need to um, change the thread color for the place or for the placement line that you're going to stitch on the stabilizer unless it's white. Uh, you do want to make sure that you can see it clearly. When your background fabric is securely in the hoop, you want to do double check number one, which is to hold the hoop up to a light source and look at it from behind. Make sure that the placement line based on the background fabric is lined up perfectly with the placement line that you stitched onto the stabilizer and hoop. And I confess when I was doing this, I completely forgot to do, I, I forgot basically, so you can see that I've already stitched my applique placement lines out here. I recommend that you do this check before you stitch the applique placement lines because if you need to make any adjustment, it's going to be a simple matter of just um, taking the tape away and repositioning. Um, if I'd needed to make an adjustment here, I would have had to unstitch all of my um, applique placement lines and let me tell you, I don't like having to unstitch anything. So make sure you do this check before you stitch your applique placement lines. Again, you wanna do double check number two, hold the hoop up next to the screen on your embroidery machine, showing you that you've actually got the design in the right place. And it's gonna be pretty easy to tell if it looks like it's gonna stitch in the right place on the background fabric. Then, after you've done your two double checks, you want to stitch out color number two, which is the basting line and the applique placement lines. Now you can go ahead and remove all of the, um, the basting line from your background fabric. So again, I'm talking about the basting line that we stitched to mark the background fabric. So you want to get that out from underneath your applique shapes. Fuse your applique shapes in place, back onto the machine, continue stitching, and then you're all done. So now you're gonna remove everything, everything from the machine, or remove the hoop from the machine, remove everything from the hoop, and you're going to clip the outer basting line every three to four stitches so that when you tear the stabilizer away that was in the hoop, those basting stitches are going to come right out. You're also, because you've done both hoopings, you've got a completed block. Now you're going to remove the stabilizer that was based into the background fabric. So you're gonna remove all of the stabilizer from around the outside of the applique shapes. Again, no need to remove the stabilizer from underneath the applique shapes. Now we're all done with the embroidery and we need to trim the background. So if you go to the magazine, it tells you that you need to trim the background to a nine inch square. And you want to make sure that your um, finished block is nicely pressed. And I'm using the Michael Miller fabric here. I prefer to not put any starch on. I'm confident that any wrinkles that do occur, I can eliminate those when I'm quilting. Um, it, it, it's up to you if you want to use a little bit of spray starch or Marianne's Best Press on your background fabric before you do the stitching and that's going to eliminate the wrinkly bits that you can see in my picture here. As far as trimming the background, the placement line 
that you draw onto your stabilizer and baste it onto your background fabric, that's a really good line. You should more than likely be able to see the needle holes in the fabric um, so that you can know exactly where the center of your block is. So if you use a square ruler, and I am using a 12 and a half inch square here, I wanna make sure that it's bigger than the nine inch square that I'm trimming to, but not too big. So I'm putting the ruler onto the blocks and I'm aligning the four and a half inch block, uh, mark on the ruler vertically and horizontally using the, um, the needle holes from the basting line to give me my center. Now, if you can't see those, there's a second measure that you can use and that's the turquoise circle. So the right hand side of the circle, there is an inch or there should be an inch to the right hand side of that and also an inch to the bottom of it if your um, cut is in the right place. So you can align the one inch mark on your ruler vertically and on the right hand side of the circle and align the eight inch mark horizontally along the bottom of the circle. And that's going to give you, um, that, that's going to make sure that your embroidery is in the center of your trimmed block. Now I'm going to add the borders. Um, I added the sides first and then the top and bottom. Um, doesn't matter if you do the sides first or the top and bottom first. Um, so it's um, kind of rotated 90, it doesn't really matter there. Whoa, skip the slide. Then for part one, you've also got the piece blocks and you're going to make eight of those as per the instructions that you'll find in the magazine. So by the time you're done, you'll have your four embroidered blocks and you'll have your eight piece blocks and you can put them to one side and wait for part two. So that's how it works. And does anybody have any questions? I'm going to have a quick look at the chat here. Um, and bear with me just a little bit as I'm looking. Can you use a Bonina Jumbo Hoop? Okay, absolutely. Yes, you can. Um, let's see. I know that some of you are having trouble with the sound. Hopefully that will be fixed in the, um, in the replay. Thank you for all the beautiful comments. Um, I was going to get a scan and cut. Would this be beneficial? Absolutely. Either the scan and cut or the cameo cutter is going to give you a great result with the SVG files. And I think I'm also going to be getting a scan and cut yesterday after my friend came over with her brand new one that she got for Christmas. Um, it wasn't so simple taking this thing out of the box and making it cut. So I'm thinking I'm going to be buying one and writing a blog post on how to do that because I know that there are a bunch of you out there with the, um, with the scan and cut. Somebody's saying that the, um, the cushion quilter squaring blocker is on sale at Amazon. Um, your local Bonina dealer can also order that for you. Um, love, love, love the triple stitch around the satin stitches. Thank you, Alicia. I love that too. It gives a really nice, um, a really nice finish. Cindy's wondering about the Bonina Cutwork tool. I have not got Bonina Cutwork for this particular project. Um, don't have those. Sorry, Ruth is asking, do we start all the embroidered blocks with a 10 inch square background? No, the, um, they're not all going to be 10 inches. So make sure that you read the instructions in the magazine for each part and that will tell you um, how big the block needs to be. The second block that we're gonna work on in part two, block B, that actually is a 12 inch finished block without a border. So that one, you're gonna to need to cut that one out at um, 14 inches. So make sure that you read the instructions for each part first. 
Um, let's see, what issue of McCall's Quilting Magazine do we need for this first block? The January, February 2016 issue. Do we use any batting when embroidering these blocks? No, this is pure embroidered applique. You're going to make the quilt top first and then quilt it. Um, quilt it as you would a normal quilt. Um, as fast as I'm looking at questions, they are jumping away as you add them to the bottom. I'm not seeing any more. Um, will the video be available after the webinar? Absolutely. I'll send you a link out tomorrow with a replay link. Uh, it will be available until midnight on Saturday for you to watch online. And there's also going to be the option to purchase a DVD. I know that some people don't have the fast internet at home, so you, you will be able to purchase the webinar on DVD and there'll be a nice little discount in the checkout if you purchase that before Saturday. Um, it will take a couple of weeks for those to arrive. We have to get the DVDs burned. Um, so that's going to take a couple of weeks, uh, but they will be there eventually. I am not seeing any more um, questions right now. What I will do is go through all of the questions, all of the comments, and um, if I see any questions that I haven't answered right now, um, I'll jot them down and reply in an email, which I'll send out to you all. If you want to come and see me live in 2016, um, I actually have three different occasions when I'm going to be out and about teaching. First of all, in February, um, actually that's a Friday of next week, February 5th, Friday, February 5th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I will be at Mad Bee's Quilt and Sew here in Mesa, Arizona. And we're going to make a Take Me Everywhere jewelry roll for Valentine's Day. We thought that would make a really gorgeous Valentine's Day gift for someone that you love. And so we're going to be doing that with the Take Me Everywhere portfolio and jewelry roll. Um, super fun class, quilting in the hoop. And um, that's going to be fabulous. I'm also going to be at the Quilting Bee in Spokane, Washington on Friday and Saturday, March 18th and 19th. This is a two-day class, uh, more like a retreat. We're going to do a really cool project. Um, still got to clarify exactly what that project's going to be, but we're going to have a ton of fun up there. And the girls are coming with me. Um, that's actually spring break week. I told Treasure and Scott from the Quilting Bee that if they wanted me, then they needed to bring my girls too. So we're th the three of us are going to be there at the Quilting Bee in Spokane, Washington. And then in April, the 23rd through the 25th, it's going to be a three-day event at Branham Sewing and Vacuum Superstore in Augusta, Georgia. Um, fabulous event. I'm so excited about this. Um, Nick and RJ from Branham's are putting together a great retreat. We're going to have a ton of fun. There'll be three teachers there, and you do a day in each of three classrooms. Um, my classroom, we're going to have a riot in there. It's going to be fabulous. And also Mr. Ulchi, uh, the president and owner of Benina, is coming over from Switzerland, and he's going to be coming to visit the store on the Monday. Watch the replay until actually Saturday. Um, I'll leave it up till midnight on Saturday. Again, if you want to purchase the webinar on a DVD, you can go to my website at sarahvedladesigns.com slash webinars or go to sarahvedladesigns.com and I added the webinars onto the main menu at the top there. Um, give me a couple of weeks for delivery. We do have to get the um, the DVDs burned and if you purchase it before midnight on Saturday there's going to be a nice discount in the checkout for you and let's reconvene for splash of color part two where we'll stitch out block B on Tuesday March 1st at the same time 6 p.m. Mountain 5 p.m. Pacific 8 p.m. Eastern I will look forward to seeing you there um, Block B, 
Embroidery designs will be available on Monday of next week. Thank you for all of the love notes which you replied when I you replied to me when I sent out my confession of I made a big boo boo and what should have been block C got sent out as block B and I'm still working on what should have been block B which I thought was block C. So anyway, it's all going to be fixed. We'll get those designs on Monday. And I hope to see you here again on Tuesday, March 1st. And I'm going to get my camera in gear by then so that we can do live face-to-face -face, um, questions and answers. So thanks so much for coming today. And I will look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.